Okay, bonjour. My name is David Leinster and I'm the CEO of Contemporary Calgary and it's my great honor to welcome you all to the historic Planetarium Dome, uh, both in the room and live on, the, on broadcast over Zoom for Robert Houle and Wanda Nanabush in conversation. On the occasion of the exhibition opening of Red is Beautiful, my daughter, whose name is Red, is here. You are also beautiful, thanks for coming. And her brothers and sisters, your name is not Red, but you're also beautiful. Um, Red is Beautiful is a historic um, retrospective of Robert's work spanning over five decades of his amazing career, organized and circulated by the Art Gallery of Ontario and curated by Wanda Nanabush, who you heard on the microphone before she was supposed to turn it on and talk. Uh, Robert, thank you so much um, for your contribution to contemporary art in this country um, and truly for inviting us into your work and in doing so, uh, putting us in ceremony and conversation with each other. Thank you so much. Um, before we begin, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, the Bagani, and the Kainai First Nation, the Sutina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also the home of the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. And at Contemporary Calgary, we always acknowledge that we are just steps away from the Bow River and the traditional Blackfoot name for the place where the Bow and Elba Rivers meet is Mochinstis, also called the City of Calgary. I would like to just take a brief moment before we get underway to extend our sincere thanks uh, and appreciation to the people and organizations who make evenings like this possible and exhibitions like this possible. First, on behalf of our sponsors at the TD Bank Group and the Ready Commitment, I would like to extend greetings on behalf of Robert Gazal, Senior Vice President of TD Group. Uh, TD is honored to support the Robert Houle exhibition with a goal to enrich the lives of customers, colleagues, and communities. They embed diversity and inclusion in all aspects of their relationships. It's rooted in a desire to give their customers, colleagues, and communities the confidence to thrive in a changing world by linking business, people, and philanthropy together to open doors to a more inclusive tomorrow. One where everyone has the chance to succeed and fully participate in what the future has to offer. TD is committed to being the bank and employer of choice for Indigenous peoples and communities and have long worked in collaboration with Indigenous peoples, governments, businesses, communities, and individuals to help find solutions that meet their unique banking needs. And through the Ready Commitment, the bank's corporate citizenship platform, uh, it serves to, I've lost my place, it's proud to support programs that support education to increase opportunities for youth to steward the environment and help preserve and celebrate art and culture of Indigenous peoples. Thank you so much to our friends at TD Bank and please offer them a round of applause. I would also like to thank Maurice Law, the first and only Indigenous-owned national law firm in Canada, with our thanks to Ron Maurice and Melanie Weber and their team for not only sponsoring this important exhibition, but for supporting the dinner last night that we shared with Robert and, uh, and their families who traveled from many, many places to come and celebrate with us. Uh, we appreciate your generosity, but more we appreciate the spirit in which that generosity was shared with us. And our thanks as well to Dr. John Lacey, who is a board member extraordinaire for Contemporary Calgary, and also the exhibition benefactor for this exhibition. And as always, and lastly, but not leastly, Contemporary Calgary is grateful for the generous support by many public bodies, including Calgary Arts Development, the City of Calgary, the Alberta Foundation for the Arts, the Canada Council for the Arts, as well, our community partners for Red is Beautiful, Bell Media, the Calgary Herald, DDG, Process Color, and Modern Rentals. Let's please give a round of applause for all of these people who make this possible. <laughs> Thanks, Wanda. Uh, I'd like to now introduce Ryan Doherty, a senior curator at Contemporary Calgary, who will introduce Wanda, or someone, but I think Wanda, we'll see. Oh. Here you go. <laughs> Thanks, David. <laughs> Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. This is indeed a very special evening. Uh, it is a, a great honor for me to introduce... I, I'm going to introduce you, Wanda, and maybe you'll come here first, and then I'll introduce 
uh, Robert after. So uh, to begin with, I've, I have known Wanda for quite some time now. I was privileged to work with her uh, some years ago on an exhibition that we brought, that she uh, had curated independently and br traveled around the world for like seven years because everybody in the country wanted to show it. That's just, uh, that's just some of the appeal that Wanda has in spades. Uh, she is a uh, curator at the Art Gallery of Ontario, where she focuses on Indigenous art and does an amazing job. She has been in, in numerous roles before that, curating and administrative roles and strategic planning roles, uh, and on and on. She's been widely and wildly published <laughs> uh, in many magazines and catalogs beyond uh, you, you can count. So... Um, uh, and more recently, I did want to mention her work with Abaquad, which is uh, a really indigenous-led series of talks about uh, uh, indigenous issues by the pe very people who make and create art. And it's just such an important series that's now become a global phenomenon. And it's just such a great pleasure to work with you, Wanda. So please, come on up to the stage. Let's get a hand for Wanda. <laughs> And now I would like to introduce the, the man of the hour, uh, Mr. Robert Hool. Uh, Robert is a, a Soto First Nations Canadian artist, but also curator, critic, educator, and on and on. He's just a cultural force. Uh, he's had a practice, uh, really, in curatorial and artistic practice since the 70s. Uh, he's really particularly known for his role in bridging the gap between uh, contemporary First Nations uh, art and the broader Canadian art scene, both through his, his amazing paintings, and, but also through his writing and involvement in other high-profile exhibitions, uh, such as Land, Spirit, Power, First Nations at the National Gallery of Canada, no less. Uh, Robert is known nationally, internationally. He is one of the most significant artists in this country, and certainly one of the most significant Indigenous artists around the world. So it is just um, absolutely such an honor that we were able to bring this show that Wanda curated with the Art Gallery of Ontario that is also you know, going to be traveling to the Winnipeg Art Gallery and the Smithsonian uh, Museum of, of the American Indian. For no less than one year, they're going to be showing Robert's work to you know, millions of people. So uh, to be part of that is really special. To bring this work to our community uh, is, is really important. The themes in this work are, are ones that need to be addressed. And... Uh, what a pleasure to do it with Robert. So um, before Robert comes up, I actually wanted to bring up Faye, uh, who needs no introduction. Where's Faye? Is she not here yet? Uh-oh. Um, okay, the party well, was too good the last party. night. <laughs> Uh, well, then I will share with this audience that uh, last night we did indeed have a, a dinner celebrating uh, Robert and his contributions. Uh, we also had a really special moment where uh, Faye's uh, family, the Heavy Shield family, bestowed upon Robert a Blackfoot name. Uh, that was uh, a very um, intimate uh, ceremony that was powerful and moving. Um, and he, given the, from the English name, Red Offering. Uh, which is just so apropos, uh, and I wish I could say the name <laughs> in Blackfoot. Uh, did you want to try? Do you, do you know it? <laughs> well, um, when Faye gets here, we'll have her say it. But um, thank you, Robert, if you could join us on stage. Just spread out on there, you know, just lay down. It'll be like a therapy session. <laughs> so when you were five, no. <laughs> um, welcome, everybody. Hello. I'm Wanda Nanabush Nadishnakaz. Mayan Gendo Dem, Chimna Singh, Don Jaba. I am Wolf Clan from Christian Island, or Chimna Singh as we call it. A little island in Georgian Bay. Wanted to introduce myself in my in our way, and I wanted to give Robert a chance to introduce yourself in our way. Yep. <laughs> yep. Introduce Thanks yourself for in your my way. My name is Robert. I was born in Saint Boniface, Manitoba, but I was raised in Sunday. You're gonna Bay, have to suck this there. Sunday right Bay First there. Nation, and then uh, Shinabem. I speak my 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 original tongue. Uh, I 
speak English. I speak a little French. I don't know how that works. Oh, okay. <laughs> like this, just like that. It's the easiest okay. way. Yeah. I don't know how we ever completed this exhibition together. <laughs> 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 just like this. <laughs> Anyways, I, I, I left the reserve, um, Sandy Bay, Kawikwe uh, in in Manitoba, to go to uh, a high school in Winnipeg, Siniboya, Indian Residential School. It's now closed. I did not have a bad experience there. There was a priest there, Father Shapu, who was a minister on our reserve. He became the principal there, and he would give me money to go to Pula Park across the river, Siniboyan River, from uh, Siniboya Indian Residential School, where I could study life drawing. So that was my first um, support about drawing. But I also would like to go back a little further than that. When I was about six years old, or maybe even uh, younger than that, <coughs> one of my father's relatives would come and visit, and he had a photographic memory. People would come and visit and sit down and talk, and, and those people were usually there. They came so that he could draw them. They would leave, and uh, he would draw them uh, from memory, uh, a portrait of them. And somebody once asked me, so how, how, come, did, how come did you get... Uh, to draw like that, uh, well, and that's my excuse, you know. I, it's in the blood, uh, I suppose. Um, now I don't know what to say without repeating myself, but I am very happy to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to have worked with these two gentlemen that were up here, uh, the curator and the director. And um, I've only been to Calgary. This is my second trip. I was here when I was a curator at the National Museum of Man in um, Ottawa in the early 70s uh, to make a visit at the, Royal at the Gen Glenbow Museum. I came to the Glenbow Museum to, you have a version of one of my paintings in the exhibition, The Death of Wolf. The National Gallery has one. The, the museum in, in the States has one. And so I, I came, I wanted to see it, and uh, that was the beginning of, of, of my um, interest in um, um, uh, art as, a, as an activity. But I had taught uh, uh, in Montreal after I graduated from McGill. I uh, taught James Ling High School for two years. I was, a I was a school art specialist. I would have students come to my class and from the different grades from grade eight to Shijap, grade 11, and grade. And um, now I'm here. I left the museum for <laughs> several reasons. I may bring them up later through, through, through conversation. I don't want to take any more s space and time at right now. Maybe Wanda has something to say. <laughs> 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 so uh, back to what I asked, which is just like uh, to introduce your territory, your name, uh, you wanted to introduce yourself in your your native name, your territory. Uh. Yeah, my um, Wano wants me to tell you my um, my spirit name. Uh, I was given a name by a medicine man on my on my reserve, uh, Arthur Nikazo. His name was uh, Arthur, and. Uh, he called me, um, and this is what I use now, not professionally, but sometimes I do announce it. It's not really our, our, our culture to um, use our spirit names because they're sacred. Uh, but my real name, I, I want to share that with you. I am known as, uh, <coughs> as Blue Thunder. And when the shaman gave this name to me, he, he asked me, as to how I should uh, introduce myself. Um, and sh um, I am known, in the, and then the sentence is, I am known as Blue Thunder. And I'm very proud of that. I now incorporate it into some of my subject matter in my paintings, especially the one in the exhibition here. Uh, it's on Mylar, and um, it's a joy. 
and I created that during the first pandemic and into the second pandemic as well. And it's and what you're looking at right here on screen. Can people hear him in the back or does he need to hug the mic? Just let me know. Okay. Okay, so I did want to ask you, I was going to lead right into this work because it is the most recent work in the exhibition done in 2001. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit about this because it feels sure. like a self-portrait yeah. very much. That's a good question because I've never really been able, I had the opportunity to, for somebody to ask me to explain it. I created it during the first pandemic. Uh, I had started working on a series of things that I wanted to do during the pandemic. I had a great plan. But, and I tried again in the second pandemic. Both times I just failed. I just couldn't do it. And then I decided that I, I have a cat. His name is Waban, which means morning. I found him under uh, the, um, recycling bins on, on Boxing Day. And Waban means morning. And then I said to myself, why don't I get up in the morning? And um, because in our culture, getting up in the morning with the sun is a form of prayer. And I said to myself, I'll get up and I'll get Waban up with me because that's his name, morning. And uh, it was very interesting. At one time, and over the next uh, four weeks, five weeks, and that's when I created this piece on, on, my, um, on my lap, um, I slept in. Seven o'clock in the morning. <laughs> seven o'clock in the morning, and I feel this pressure on my chest, and it's Wabbit looking at me, and I said, "It's time to get up." <laughs> yeah, so you know, and uh, I enjoyed it. It's the first time that I've actually dealt with in the most serious way, in, which means for me, in my in my personal culture of being an artist, visual person, I said, "I'm going to draw," and I just automatically took large piece of mylar, and I just started drawing um, blue thunder, <laughs> eagle in this sense, a thunderbird. And uh, it was very rough, of course. And but I knew that on mylar, it's a very durable um, surface to work on, erasing and adding, etc. cetera. And uh, it became, and next thing I knew, I had his beak uh, settled. Uh, then I had his claws, um, one claw um, uh, accomplished, and then I, I lost control somehow, and I wanted, because I wanted another hand, my personal hand, and of course I couldn't really draw my hand, so I asked my partner, Paul, I said, could I, could you pose for me with your hand? So the hand that you tell, the human hand is actually Paul's, not mine. But it, it, but it actually represents uh, my hand reaching for, reaching for the paintbrushes, my paintbrushes in, um, in a can. And that was the first time I actually really seriously worked on a personal, um, uh, traditional, spiritual idiom in my, my, in my life. And uh, I was, I was, uh, I was uh, really uh, released in many ways. I was able to fly now, you know, because I have dealt with that through, through, a, through a pandemic. Yeah because it took me about two, three months to, to finish it. And towards the end, it, when it was finished, the, the, second pan the first pandemic had just sort of calmed down, and then a second one began, but I wasn't going to do a second one, because, you know, you don't gurgitate something twice as an artist. You know, I certainly <laughs> don't do that. Some may do it, but I don't. <laughs> one of the things I was thinking about is this uh, figure, you know, transforming between, you know, the or the Thunderbird and the human. Um, this notion of transformation is very important in our, our culture. And uh, I wondered if we could talk a bit about the comparisons that are often made between shamans and artists. You know, like they do this with Morriso. Um, what do you think the relationship is? Because, you know, the Thunderbird is a communicator between the spirit world and the human world, and vice versa. Do you feel like artists and art is this kind of communication as well? Uh, no, I'm very different from uh, Norval Marceau. I met him uh, when I left the museum. I ran back. I ran to Toronto just to get away from um, repercussions of this red boy. 
had been given one of the top positions in the country, and I was nobody was happy with me because I complained about some of the uh, trajectories that were happening in the museum, like opening up medicine bundles and um, displaying uh, false face masks with tobacco behind them, which meant that they were alive. That really, that really bothered me, and it made me realize that I had to get out of there after three years. I enjoyed it. People were very kind to me. I enjoyed the, 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 um, the ethnologists, uh, the director liked me, etc. and I enjoyed myself. But um, first things first, you know, my, my, my spirituality is very, very important. Uh, that's the way I was raised. We went to the Sundance as a family, and we had, we all have spirit names and with my siblings, and uh, so I had to make a choice. So when I left the museum that Sunday, the day after, well, it was Friday, so Sunday was my calls to my my mother would call, oh yeah, Robert, you haven't called me. <laughs> What's the matter? <laughs> I said, Mom, I I quit the museum. You're kidding. He said, what are you going to do now? How are you going to survive? And I said, well, I certainly will try. He says, well, I can only say one thing to you. He says, um, she said, um, don't paint anything you don't know. And I said, and I said to my mom, that's very, very profound. And I, said, and I said to myself after I got off the phone, that's very interesting because I had, I had gotten the same kind of message from Jackson Beardy, which is a native artist, from Man late artist uh, from Manitoba, and we were talking one time, and, and he was uh, an elder p to, to me, and his advice to me is, was to say to me, I don't paint anything I don't know. So that's been the basis of my artistic life as, a, as, a, as an artist, as a painter, since I left the museum. I saw things there that shouldn't have happened. It, it, was, a, it was a desecration of our spiritual values, uh, me opening medicine bundles, um, um, displaying um, live false face masks. And I mean by live, if a false face mask, a near client false face mask, put in a Shoni mask, if it has tobacco behind it inside when you turn it around, it means it's alive, it's been used, it's been activated. Mm. So when I began to be discouraged with the museum, I said to myself, let me see. Um, 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 I had put my gloves on and went to the collection room, and I found the, the false face masks there, and I chose which ones they were lying there, and I turned them around, sure enough, what I suspected. They had tobacco in them, which meant that they were alive. And I instantly said, I've got to get out of here. Mm. But the other thing was, the first thing, there were two things. The other one was this ethnochemist, I like that word, ethnochemist. Uh, she came <laughs> in, and again, I was walking <laughs> through, the, through the collections room. There's this large table. And she had opened a medicine bundle. I knew right away, and I looked at the labels. I had heard about this before a bit, uh, as, as well from, from colleagues. And uh, he said to me, he said, you know, the, 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 the medicine man was afraid that his children had become so profoundly Catholic that they would uh, bury it or throw it away or something. So he asked the museum to look after the medicine bundle. Knowing that med the medicine bundle is a living thing for us uh, spiritually, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I, I, when I saw that, I looked at the card, and then I went over to 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 the main card thing, and sure enough, it was that medicine bundle from Alberta that was alive and had been opened and been examined chemically, and I said, gotta go. <laughs> so this was 1980, and you were leaving the Canadian Museum of what was then called Man, and then became Civilization and History. You can tell the whole history of the country through that. Um, I uh, was thinking about, uh, since you mentioned the false face masks, um, thinking about Oka in 1990, so jump ahead 10 years, and um, your action in Toronto, in your studio, with these banners, not these specific ones. The originals are at the Thunder Bay Art Gallery. Um, but here you can see the words sovereign, longhouse, land cut, and false face. I was wondering if you could talk about your action of solidarity in your studio during the 78-day standoff um, 
and land, land, land claim, land rights uh, fight um, on behalf of Ganastage, who definitely were fighting for their spirituality because it was the pines, which is their burial ground and their ceremonial grounds. Well, historically what it is is I had studied art history at McGill and some studio work. And um, um, so I began to get, uh, I was in an office for the Institute of American Indian Studies. And I was teaching there uh, as well. And uh, the lady that I shared the office with was from Ganawage. And she was a, um, um, an elderly woman and she had, uh, and she was traditional. Kanawage is actually a very Christian town, a Catholic town, uh, uh, com native community. But there was a new movement in Kanawage about uh, uh, building up a longhouse, which is a, um, a more traditional form of, of, of praying. And um, one guy, another spiritual man, a Mohawk, from uh, Kanatsatage, which is the other uh, Mohawk community just outside of Oka, asked me, he says, so would you like to go and teach the native children at the new um, um, uh, longhouse school for um, native children who are whose parents are longhouse? And I said, sure, yeah, sure. And it was good. Uh, uh, some of them became, uh, I have there's pictures of them when they were all sort of young, became uh, um, the warriors during the Oka crisis. I didn't teach them that, okay? I just want everybody <laughs> to know that. <laughs> Anyways, they were so happy. They said to me, said, we'll take you to our longhouse. And they took me to the longhouse with Renata, my assistant at that time. And uh, she, uh, we uh, sat down and they performed for us. It was very, very touching. So I've become, uh, become very uh, in, in involved with, uh, with um, um, and when Oka happened, um, I knew some of the most important words, sovereign, longhouse, land claim, false face. And um, I made these banners uh, during the Oka crisis. And what I did was, these were banners from my studio on Queen Street uh, in Toronto. Uh, but I didn't know that if I closed my curtains and I put these banners in my, that I would not have um, sunlight. So you put them in the window where the, these words are facing the street, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, no light. So, and you know, I'm a, I'm a colorist. So I need light to... to, to <laughs> So what do I do? So I land up making prints in in um, uh, uh, in New York. I knew this that I had met in uh, uh, the Heard Museum, uh, a Navajo artist who was a main a printmaker at uh, uh, a college in in New York. And I asked, I called him and I said, "Can I come over? Can I can I um, uh, do a print?" And so that's what I did, because so, uh, it's stupid me. My curtains are closed, and I, there's no sunlight. And how do I, you know, I need light. I don't use, na I don't use fluorescent lights either. It's just be being a colorist, I, there's a big difference between fluorescent lights and other kind of lights. It, it affects the, 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 the color. So I, that's, and that's what happened. That's what. That's what happened to me with these, these, with, the, with these particular banners. And when Oka happened as well, I went to the, la I went to, to, to back to Kanasatake as opposed to Kanawage, Kanasatake, because this is where the golf course was. And I went there and uh, um, it inspired me. Uh, I've always been inspired by, by, by spirituality like that. So thinking also about the, um, I mean, I th one of the things on everyone's mind in this country is, the, is residential schools and the uncovering of mass graves. The worst part of it for me, especially because I work in a white institution and I work in a white world, um, is that people act shocked. Meanwhile, we've been telling them about this you know, forever since the 60s and 70s. It's just we weren't believed. Um, so now with this new technology, we can be believed. Um, 
but you have been at the forefront of, of bringing this discourse into the art world and into museums through your work, first of all, with Sandy Bay, you know, done 1988, 1989. Can we talk about that work, and then we'll talk about this work right after? This is more recent. Uh, this, one, this one is about one of my first um, um, activities and dealing with the residential school experience. But let me preface that by saying just more recently, um, the lost children. Myself and my two sisters that are next in line in birth at home, we could have died too. Because when we were apprehended to go to the residential school on my reserve, we weren't there for very long. We got tuberculosis. But my mother had been uh, a nursing aide at St. Boniface Hospital in across the river from Winnipeg. So she knew and was friendly with the regional nurse. She called her, she called her, she told her what was wrong with the children, with us. She immediately took us over to uh, Brandon Sanatorium. Otherwise, we would have we would have been one of those lost children. I do know how to work a microphone. I do remember um, sitting with you when you were working through uh, new memories that were coming up after the 2006 apology on June 11th. I'll always remember it because it's my fucking birthday. Um, but uh, we had a similar sentiment. Neither of us wanted to go see the apology. And that was interesting. I didn't, um, my mother went to residential school, so it's very intimate to me as well. And we are 60s scoop in our generation, uh, very complicatedly so. Um, but I wondered if uh, you could speak a bit about that, the, both in not going to the apology and why, and then, you know, the memories that were arising and how painting and drawing kind of can be a healing practice or a way of, of dealing with those memories. I don't get it. Uh, did you go to the apology when they apologized for residential schools in 2006? Yeah, uh, yes, I uh, yes, I did, but there were two lines. One was to meet uh, the prime minister, who I didn't like, and one was another line, and I took the other line. Um, <coughs> There's no, uh, for me, as a survivor, uh, an apology is an apology. It's not really very much on, uh, unless, unless it's really real, you know. Um, no, I've never had any kind of um, anxiety or, or, or reaction to, to an apology. But I will tell you this, uh, the lost children uh, made me cry. Most interesting thing that happened to me from um, a white man, a director of the Art Gallery of Ontario. When this, when the lost children scene was happening in our in our television and our newspapers and everything, so I, I, I suffered. I really, really, you know, but I didn't want to share this. I, it was just personal. But then I get a call. I talked to my family, of course. I talked to my sisters about this because they're all survivors, too, and my brothers. And um, I got a call. I didn't know who this person was. It was a Wednesday. And uh, it was a director of the Art Gallery of Ontario. And he said to me, he says, um, how are you coping? And I said, I'm fine. I said, uh, um, have you talked to your family? And, and they're calm and everything. F for the longest time, I didn't know who I was talking to. And, uh, really, seriously. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be facetious, but it's the truth. And finally, I find out who, who he was. But then I said to him, I said, thank you for, 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 for your kind words. And he said to me, he says, uh, have you talked to your family? And I said, yes, I've talked to them. And, uh, and I said, uh, one of my sisters told me that I needed a ceremony. And at that point, he said to me, he says, uh, you want a ceremony? We will help you have one at the, muse at the Art Gallery of Ontario. And I said, wow, you know. Uh, 
and I sort of skated around thinking that, okay, this is, this is not really going to happen. Next thing I knew, you know, he said, no, we'll take care of you. We'll, take care. we'll, we'll give you an opportunity to, do, to have a ceremony at the, uh, at the art gallery. So we started to plan. She ga he gave me an assistant, and then uh, we, started, we started planning, and we invited the people, and we, we invited seven Native women from the Native Center, not from the Native Center, but from another Native organization near, near where I live. Seven women, all survivors, came in their long dresses and, and, and their, their hand drums, and, um, and they, seven of them, and they sang. And this is in the Walker Court, uh, and uh, we also asked people to bring shoes, children's shoes. And my partner went and bought some baby, sh baby shoes, and we put them all around in a circle. And we put some other ones that were um, uh, from uh, men's shoes, women's shoes. We put them outside so that people on the street could replace them with their old shoes <laughs> and take the new ones. And that happened very well. And then we had a, and then we had a, um, a sacred fire in the Grange, which is a park after the museum. And uh, it was wonderful. One of the uh, seven women, and she came up to me at one point because I was sitting there so I couldn't see them. She said, would you like us to sing, a s would you like a song? Would you, uh, is there a song that you know? And I said, no, I don't. But she said, would you, would you sing a lullaby? And she said, yes, we will. So she went back to the group. And they, and they, all, seven, they all stood up and they all had their own hand drums. And they, s they started to sing a lullaby. It was the most painful lullaby I've ever heard. Some of the women broke down. But it was the most cathartic thing that I experienced during this horrible time that it had triggered a memory of pain, uh, of abuse, that's all I can say. I don't to make myself cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't have to share beyond what you want. <laughs> um, the schoolroom, the, this is the original, the, or, sorry, went too fast. So this is the first work that you did. I was thinking about this when you were talking because it also has the lullaby that your mom would sing to you. Oh, yes, okay, sure. This painting, every Friday we would go home. Um, my sisters, uh, my sisters, my late sisters, Vivian and Catherine, we would leave uh, the residential school around 4 o'clock after classes, and we were allowed to go home. And we would see our parents' houses from the top roof of, those of that building. And it made me cry. I was just seven, six years old. And uh, we'd run home, we'd sing and talk our language because we were not allowed to speak it at, at the school. And uh, we would get home, and, uh, um, and that night, Friday night, our mother would sing to us this hymn, Jesus Kizakian, Anamanituian, uh, you know, that uh, uh, Jesus, we love you even though you're a God. And just, it just, and I put it on this painting. The, I thought that doing this painting would have released my pain from the residential school. It's, it's not until that happened at the AGO with the shoes, with the lost children, that I actually dealt with, with how serious and how painful it was that we had gone through. I still, of course, still, it's still very, uh, very raw for me. Even at my age, at 75, you know, it's still very raw. Uh, I was abused. I, I, I was I was punished for speaking my language. Uh, all the other cliches that you probably all know, you know. But uh, and you think that because I don't say anything that I've dealt with it. Well, we deal with it, but yet at the same time, with the way emotion works, you know. I know what emotion is as a as an artist, as a painter, you know. And it just reoccurs. Mm -hmm. That is the definition of the <laughs> trauma, and also it occurs intergenerationally because we pass it down over and over and over again. Have some water. And uh, we are 
I think we're supposed to take questions from the audience, right? Yes, okay. Um, so I'm looking at you guys now, and I'm thinking, who has a question out there for? Okay. Um, so Robert's going to take a five-second break or a couple-minute break. Um, so your questions will have to be directed at me first until Robert comes back. Um, I can speak a bit about um, some of the curating of material like this while you think of a question. I, um, when curating traumatic material or the way that art can d address um, uh, residential schools and different kinds of traumas our communities face, uh, some people choose to put a trigger warning up or something like this. Um, my choice was to put uh, healing works in the same space so that there's always a touchstone. So here you have the Sandy Bay uh, work, but then you also have these four shaman that are right next to it. So it's like shaman never die, shaman dream in color, um, shaman heals by touching. So these are ways of us sort of reclaiming and how hard we fought to keep these traditions alive even though our culture was banned from after 1850s until the 1950s, and also um, through the residential school system and a number of other horrible policies where this is the very thing that was meant to be broken um, was our relationship to our spirituality. So I always include this kind of work with his other work that addresses the abuses that happened. So in the other, in the residential school room, there is Transforming Blue Thunder, which Robert talked about, which is his power as an artist. It is his power as his spirit name. It's, it's all of that in there. So um, that's sort of my way of kind of addressing the fact that it can be triggering for people. But we aren't just victims of anything. We're also extremely powerful human beings. So I always want to think of those things together. So. Is there any questions? Robert's just going to the bathroom. No need to feel concerned. He's not bawling in the hallway about residential schools or anything. He just needed to pee. So uh, feel free to ask a question. I could bring the mic to you. You're right. And it's a little, I can't see anyone in the back because of this light that's shining in my eyes. So you might want to stand up. Well, I can ask a question. Um, actually, I was talking to Walter May in the gallery a little earlier, and we were looking at the residential school room, and you know, I think the uh, the ones on the left and right walls are quite clear. You know, there's school and praying and these different things. Um, the center panels, yeah, you're, you're gonna, there it is there. The center panels, which are just colors. I wonder if yeah. if um, you've had conversations with Robert about that and their significance. Well, the, I mean. Color has its own spiritual capacity, just in itself, in and of itself. Um, but the the names that fit with the paintings, like one, it's a translation of the visual image into the language, uh, Soto. Um, but two, it also is a distillation of moments from his memories of his experience during residential school, like the things that stick. Uh, the things that were traumatic. So you'll see sleeping. You know, something as simple as sleeping uh, becomes something, uh, you know, something very scary and something really awful. Uh, so um, that's how I think of it. And then also uh, he has his land at the very end. You know, San Sandy Bay is the last kind of image in both sides. And that is like he has talked often about how you'll go to the water, or you'll go walking on the water as a way of letting go, as a way of uh, putting the emotions out into the land or into the water, and how home can be a place for healing. So I think that's part of that. The abstraction, that's, that's who Robert is as an artist, so how could he not include <laughs> this, <laughs> the color fields and the, the abstract work um, at the end? because this is where he has taken us. He's not a representational artist in, in the traditional sense. He has some of that in his practice, but m largely he's, he's interested in abstraction. And he's like transformed abstraction. 
immensely. Are there no brave humans out here with any curiosity? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> So abstraction in the Western sense was a process of stripping out like organic material, emotional content, like becoming as cold as cold as cold. So when he saw like somebody like Modrian, for example, very masculine, he found like as an Anishinaabe man looking at uh, a very, very masculinist work that he couldn't relate. So his sense of abstraction would come from somewhere else. So he had to go searching uh, for where his abstraction comes from. And abstraction is the oldest art of this land. It, f it comes from First Nations culture. So the way we use symbols, the way we weave, we paint, all of that. And even the sense of, um, I and I'm going beyond Robert, <laughs> I'm going to say some things he might not say. But even our physical way of operating in the world, the fact that we can map a space as if we've flown it from the sky. So this kind that's an abstraction when you can map a territory as if you've seen it from the sky, but you've only ever walked it. So that's a form of abstraction as well. So, um, and then he found uh, Barnett Newman as well, and thinking about spirituality, and spirituality en starts to enter abstraction at this point. So he brings all of those things together. And uh, you start to see him like uh, piercing the, the paint with quills, uh, bringing in organic material like hide, um, but still a deep colorist. Um, uh, we're just talking about the importance of abstraction in your work and why you include the, um, uh, the red color uh, palette at the very end of the residential school room series. Uh, so I was just answering for you <laughs> while you emptied your bladder. <laughs> um, but I wondered if you wanted to say something about abstraction from your point of view in terms of how you've grappled with it and what you feel you've brought to it that maybe is different. I talked about Modrian, your relationship to that. Hello. What I mean by that is that um, when I started seriously uh, at, at McGill, uh, art history, uh, studio work, and then we were asked to paint love, and I had no idea until I started seeing my um, classmates. They were all influenced by Andy Warhol, um, all the uh, Russian work, uh, big hearts, uh, Warhols, and, and I said, I just straight from the reservation at, at, at that time, you know. I had been at the University of Manitoba for uh, a couple of years studying uh, uh, Canadian uh, Christian philosophy, and I said, I got to get out of here. So I, I went to Montreal. I was actually recruited to go to, go to school at McGill, and, but uh, I said, what? Do I paint? What do I, what, you know? And I didn't know much about color, but I knew intuitively uh, uh, what colors I like and what actually inspired me or gave me an, an, an inner an, an inner perspective uh, and, a, and a great release of passion. Um, <coughs> and then we were asked to paint love. I didn't know what I do, so I started studying. Um, um, a study by, uh, 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 I think it was Elizabeth Lyford. It was a, uh, an American woman uh, hired by the uh, Indian and Northern Affairs in Washington to study quill work. So I, uh, the geometry was big at, at this time. And I started, and I was fascinated with, uh, with quill work and, uh, and the designs, the shapes that came out of uh, applying quills on on hide and baskets, et cetera. And uh, the, rest is, the rest is really history. And um, um, 
I've, I've lost myself uh, from this little, the what was your what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> that was the <laughs> yeah, just your relationship to abstraction, but okay, yeah, um, yeah. So the Ojibwe Designs books is where you sort of got some of your inspiration for that early work. And I tried to once I once I began to articulate more and understand more of of how quill work designs work and how they came to be, how they influenced the design. Uh, I, and I started to see objects. I made more visits to the, to the uh, museum in Mo Montreal. And, uh, um, I, but I rejected all of the, um, uh, what my fellow students were doing because I knew I was different from them and I knew that I shouldn't just follow that. I've always been like that. Uh, I'm native, I'm Soto. You know, I'm just going to go my way as, as much as as much as make it as relevant as possible in the, in the lar for the larger world to understand and to identify with and to enjoy. Uh, so I created this beautiful little painting, yeah, ah, no more than this size, that, and it's, and it was called um, "Red is Beautiful," and Wanda saw the vision in it and entitled it as part of her. Uh, curatorial um, uh, majesty in <laughs> at, the <laughs> at the Royal Ontario Museum. And the rest is really history, and I'm really quite, quite happy to have had the opportunity to be surrounded and to attract uh, uh, young people about, because I taught art to Native students at the Ontario College of Art from 1990 for about 10 years. And um, some of them are great artists today. And uh, I'm very proud of that. Um, but of course, now I've lost what your question was. <laughs> <laughs> it's OK. The question is over. <laughs> 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 and we are at time. It is 6.59. Do you want me to take one more question or no? Because I believe Chris has his opening at 7, right? 8? Oh, OK. Yeah, so we've got so, lots of time. OK. Well, if there is another question out there, I will gladly I do, hear you. I do you. have a, a, a question from the online community. Well, we love you, too. <laughs> um, the question is, um, he states that red is also a color of monopoly. And by monopoly, meaning like control, like the, the color of dictatorship or something to that effect. And he asks, or she asks, sorry, how, how much emotion, I think, of, of, of this sense is in Red is Beautiful in your point of view, Robert? Um, uh, personally, Red is just a, um, a, a, an emotional reaction to a color, uh, but it's also symbolic in many ways. It's our heart. It's, 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 it runs through our entire body. And... Um, um, Beyond that, I don't know how I can articulate a much more a much more profound, serious answer to your question. Not that it's not se not that it's serious, but I know that uh, 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 I think red, the color red, helped me understand um, uh, more about the complexity of the different colors that exist in 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 in, in the in the color range. You know, and but in many ways there are many uh, there are ways that you can use red as a as a national color as well. Our our the Canadian flag is a, is an example. There are other, there are other examples, but red is also uh, for us a life form in our culture. You know, it re it represents uh, uh, birth. It represents uh, uh, our heart, our love. And th that's about you know. Uh, and I never, I and I never mix my colors. Uh, it's just a way of, for me, the purity of color. The, um, and <coughs> when I created uh, Sandy Bay, this painting that's in the show, I went home to uh, for four months. Uh, it was a residency at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, uh, and that's when I first really seriously took a uh, a jab at uh, what is color, or if you're a colorist. And and I went to visit my s one of my sisters, Stella's, and uh, I asked her husband when I when I was visiting him about color, 
And he said to me, it's something very simple. He said to me, uh, you know, you'll find color if you look at the snow. On the way back from near Brandon or uh, uh, near Elphinstone, uh, going back to, to Winnipeg, and I thought about it, and I looked again at what he had said, and I learned something there. And from that moment on, I realized what it meant to be uh, a colorist, uh, to be to be to play, to allow color to play an essential, emotional, emotive, uh, uh, spiritual, mostly spiritual uh, um, reason for your choice of that. I guess I can also say that in titling the exhibition, I chose Red is Beautiful because um, for a number of reasons. One is that it is the first work that Robert sold. So it is the beginning of a professional career. Red is Beautiful is the title of that work. Um, it's also marks you as a colorist, which is what you were talking about two seconds ago. And then the other reasons are it's, it's a statement that actually makes sense to Native people. So it's actually for us, in a sense, um, it's part of the 70s, it's part of the American Indian movement, it's part of Native sovereignty movement. Um, it is the reversal of kind of racist ideas about us being redskins and this kind of bullshit. Uh, so, see, I didn't say fuck, I just said shit. So that's okay, right? <laughs> um, so, I mean, these things are extremely important to, uh, to art, you know, our, our artists are not separated from our political movements and often artists are leading, leading these movements. So for me, Red is Beautiful is also about that. Um, and I'm obsessed with the color as well as anyone who knows me. <laughs> um, so it has amazing, incredible meanings. Of course, red can mean whatever people put into it. Um, we can ask psychologists what it means. We can ask biologists what it means. We can ask artists. Um, but that's just like where Robert and I are coming from with the color red. Definitely not thinking about corporations. Definitely not thinking about nations. Robert, just a question. Maybe I'll also invite the audience if they have another one. And Wanda, if you could go to the slide with Kanata. And we were told, Robert, you shared a story yesterday that maybe you could share with this audience about that work, Kanata, and the relationship to We Were Told. You want me to say something about that yeah. particular painting? Yeah, I got a call from uh, the Confederation Center in PI uh, two or three years ago, maybe more, I'm not sure. Uh, if you look at the date, it will. <laughs> Anyways, I get a call from the director, and he says to me, he says, uh, we would like to commission you to do uh, a painting after uh, Kana Satage, the one, the larger painting that was in the show as well. And I said, I don't know. I said, um, uh, I don't really like to regurgitate myself. And I said, and uh, what do you mean? And I said, I didn't really like drawing the burning of churches and, and French people lying in the, in the fields of Abraham and all these people surrounding the dying general. And I said, all of that is a fallacy. And I said, I knew that from art history that uh, you know, uh, history paintings are full of fallacies. You know, it's all made up uh, and paid by uh, expensive, uh, expensively. Um, and, and that was really my approach to, to but but of course, I also wanted to deal with an another angle to this. And, and so I, th I thought of something I had learned, uh, which is um, uh, when the Europeans arrive, and you can see that in that painting with, with the looking, looking uh, east, uh, and you'll see the Gulf of St. Lawrence, we were told that uh, um, uh, there would be a 700 year, uh, there was a legend, 700 year history of, of, of poverty and, and distress uh, with the arrival of, of the Europeans. In many ways, of course, it's true, you know. Um, boundaries change. Um, some tribes got uh, annihilated. It's a very painful history. Uh, and I really didn't want to do Canada all over again. 
So I decided to paint the Plains of Abraham, um, an historical site, and I wanted uh, I removed uh, all the all the trees and all the all the warrior all the uh, participants from 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 Canada that, that that larger work, and I had nothing but the warrior the uh, um, sitting there, and um, but I had learned something from the larger painting. I realized that as a, as a colorist, I realized that um, um, Kanata uh, uh, paint, and I knew that from the uh, group of seven, you paint uh, an ochre color and a surface. Uh, it, uh, it did, a lot of them did that too, and, and then painted on top of, uh, on top of that. Um, it somehow uh, worked well with uh, Regenerating or uh, articulating much more, much more uh, vividly, uh, the the colors. Once the paint began to penetrate uh, the second layer of paint, but with with my warrior in um, Windamawin, we were told um, I did not. Uh, uh, I painted all of the canvas in in the in the um, group of seven style. There was a ochre kind of wash over it, but then I painted over it, but not around the warrior. I wanted him to glow, and, and to, to this day it still glows. It has n uh, there's no c other color uh, under underneath uh, the warrior, and I. It was painful, it painful in the sense that I did not know uh, how or what. The plains of Abraham looked like. Uh, I looked for pictures as to there, there really isn't any about what kind of um, uh, trees or what kind of you know. I would what I would do is uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, about three o'clock, I would close down, and, but I would put a tape over the field, um, a long tape, a log, let's say, or something like that, and. I would leave it there overnight, just to give me an idea as to see if in my dreams something would happen. Uh, generally, it does. It, give me, it certainly gave me a lot more um, uh, confidence as to how this area would, uh, would happen. And, um, and also, not putting a, an oxide color as an underlay mm -hmm. on the warrior. Today, when you look at a warrior, uh, his flesh is so much more real than it would have been otherwise, where uh, you know he just glows by himself in this. And this is what I wanted to do. And he's looking to the east and and telling us from a legend that there would be a 700-year winter. And I think we've got we passed that now. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sadly, there's 200 more years to go. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, just for those of you who don't know, um, Kanata is on the right, your right, and Awinda Mawin is on the left, your left. Um, and the painting that he is referencing in Kanata, which was done in 1992, so thinking of everybody celebrating Columbus and all that BS, um, and then Native artists like turning it and talking about 500 years of colonization. So the artist is Benjamin West, and it's the death of General Wolfe is the painting. And you know, it speaks to like Canadian history and this kind of BS. Um, but this also is a good example of the way you use color and abstraction to tell even more of a story, because here you've got the blue for the British, and th or the, <laughs> which one's British and French again? <laughs> the blue is French, like see how much I care about these things? No, <laughs> uh, the French <laughs> is blue and the British are red. Um, and the natives, the, the warriors in between, right? Sandwiched in between and you've often talked about our, our space as yeah, yeah, indigenous yeah, people at that time. Yeah. And if you look very closely, just hold the. And if you look very closely at uh, the larger canvas, Kanata, uh, I made interventions. I put a woman in there. I put a native person in a canoe, paddling his way out of the scene of the crime, as you were. <laughs> <laughs> Little inside jokes. <laughs> Are there more questions? Um, I see. I Here see. Kelly, uh, Kelly has one. 
Last night, you explained to us the material that you used for the center of Kanata, and I found that very fascinating. If you'd like to share that, the, with the chalk or the whatever you used to paint that, um, the drawing in the middle, Conte? Conte. Yeah, the way you did that, because I found it very fascinating how many layers in the process. Oh. In Kanata, uh, there's probably around um, 10 layers, uh, 10 layers of Conte, Put a layer of conte, uh, put a gesso over it, because eventually, uh, if any kind of movement happens, the, the conte will, the powder will fall. You know, there's a bit of oil in it, but the oil eventually dries up and it, it'll fall. And uh, I didn't know much about that, but I kept, uh, but I kept seeing changes as, as the as the conte would dry and there would be like a certain sort of. Um, fragility to it. It didn't crack or anything, but I could see visually that, uh, that I, so, so I would keep working on it, on it. And then when I sold it to the National Gallery and it was, it was borrowed uh, by the State Lake Museum and the National Gallery was very, very afraid of that. And then they said, it's gonna cost a lot of money because I said, I would love for it to go there. You know, there was an exhibition there that I wanted to be part of. And so they had to uh, uh, create a vacuum for Canada, for the painting Canada to be in a crate so that it, there was no vibration. It was just still. So. Amazing. Are there any more questions out there? Not that I can see you. <laughs> but oh, now oh. I can. You look beautiful. Look at you pretty dudes. and. Non dudes and you're 75. Dudes are, are pimples on donkeys' butts, you're right? You said you're 75. Are you continuing to work? You're 75. Do you continue to work? You need to, do I need to work? No, do you continue do to you work? Oh, yes, of course. As, as, as long as I can steady my hand, which is still very steady, uh, I, will, uh, I, I will work. Um, but I'm not as prolific now. Um, I've started two works during the pandemic, so and I am uh, much more susceptible to, to exterior things happening. Like when the first pandemic happened, I had a great idea of, of creating uh, a new set of work. Um, Do you mind using the mic? It's just because we have an online people. Pardon? You mind oh using I'm the sorry, mic just because there's I'm people sorry. online who can't yeah, hear I'm you without it. When the first pandemic happened, I was going to create and uh, never really finished it, never really actually seriously started it. And, uh, and then I stopped and then I created uh, uh, the Mylar piece that I spoke about earlier. Uh, and this second, this second time with, uh, with the pandemic, I started again something and I couldn't finish it. I just lost all, not so much ambition, but oh, uh, I just, just could not concentrate and that's been my uh, and of course when I was much younger and much more sensitive uh, if I didn't I used to tell this to my mother and she was just, and she felt I felt like she understood I said mom I said if I don't paint if I don't draw I said I get really tired I get really s I almost get sick and she would smile and she would say I know you know and yeah but um, that's, that's the way it was. But as I got older, uh, I dealt with uh, something like that. But it is true, I, I, would, get, I would get literally uh, not feeling well if I didn't create, you know? And so many times, and I hate to admit this, I need to create, I need to draw, I need to paint, you know? Otherwise, I really, really will get sick. Physically. I want to thank you, Robert, for sharing so generously with the audience here, um, and also for the brilliance you bring through your work. And uh, yeah, we hope you don't stop anytime soon. <laughs> um, I also want to thank uh, Contemporary Calgary, particularly Ryan, and oh my god, your name just slipped right out of my head, David. Um, for yeah, being the visionaries and the beautiful humans that you are. Um, I love working with both of you. 
Um, and I want to thank the entire audience here as well for coming to this talk and for engaging Robert's work in the exhibition. And uh, we will see you over drinks and all kinds of things this evening. Um, well, you don't know how crazy we can get sometimes. So let's Cra wait, wait for it, wait for it. Um, just kidding. OK, so that's my thank yous. Well, I hope you will continue to pay interest in what we do. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I guess I want to thank Robert's family also for making the 12-hour drive here. Thanks, Wanda, and thanks, Robert. So just to give you a sense of some uh, housekeeping particulars, um, the good news is, is you don't have to look at them here. You can actually go see them in the Flanagan Gallery. Uh, just uh, if you head down the ramp and keep heading left until you can't head left any longer, you'll find uh, Red is Beautiful. And, and uh, also uh, Chris Carreri's uh, That There It is immediately outside the Ring Gallery. We'll give some remarks and our appreciation of Chris in a moment at eight o'clock, we'll be doing remarks in the atrium, but um, the bar and beverages are out in the atrium and um, Robert and his family and Wanda will be around uh, uh, all evening. So. Uh, thank you so much for being here, and uh, if you would like to exit, please exit down this way. Uh, don't exit through the top. Um, we'll put the house lights on so it's easier to walk out of here. Thank you.